Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Healing from Historical Trauma, Understanding Origins. My name is B.C. Echohawk. On behalf of the Native Connections team and contracting officer representatives Maureen Madison and Jan Denbar Cooper, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're recording today's webinar and all phone lines will be muted. Please don't hesitate to use the chat box for questions throughout the session. Right now, I'm gonna hand it over to our GTA, Marie Schuyler Griever for some introductions, followed by our opening in a good way. Marie? Hi there, everyone. I'd like to start off first with introducing our colleague, Jennifer Nanez. Um, she has moved on to a new position and we wish her well. However, we want to acknowledge her extensive efforts in creating this series. It was an honor and privilege to work with her. Kadija Lolux, Sagoli Sagwe, Aniata Aga, Niwajitalot. So, hello everyone. My name is Marie Schuyler Drever. I come to you from the Oneida and Odawa people. And I'll send this on over to my colleague, Leon. Hey, I'm Betu Waste, Leon Leader Charge. My name is, uh, and I'm, I'm part of the Sichango Ogala Lakota Nation. Rosebud Sioux Tribe and Ogala Sioux Tribe, and I'd like to transition into opening us in a good way and talking about healing in a good way. So we'll share a we wang wa chiki olowa. Oh, we are all related. Thank you. Thank you. Now I would like to present to you the following subject matter experts who helped us in creating this series. We thank them for sharing their knowledge. Mr. Regis Pecos of the Cochiti Pueblo, Ms. Ethelene Ironcloud Two Dogs, Ogallala Lakota Nation, Dr. Josie Chase, Mandan Hadatsa, Mr. Robert Brown, Oneida Nation, and Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, Papa Ogalala Lakota. The Healing from Historical Trauma series is presented in a hybrid model with recorded presentations and live facilitation. And while it is rooted in a multifaceted view, today we are seeing just two of these views, Pueblo and Lakota. We will hear historical facts that might be triggering, so please ground yourselves in smudge and prayer. We will be available through private chat to assist with processing. In developing this series, tears were shed with our presenters, not from grief, but in witnessing our resilience. While part one is emotional, it is our history. Ultimately, we hope to show our resilience as Native people. This journey was not intended to bring up wounds. However, to see perspectives and insight, to work through the traumas, to hold a sense of rebirth to our ceremonies and traditional ways, and emerge with pride and resilience. The next three parts in the series will cover understanding our trauma, boarding school impacts, and self-determination. Please be sure to join us for the remainder of this series as we continue to move forward in discussing our resilience and strengths. These objectives are addressing all four parts of the series and feel free if any triggers come about to step out and take a moment. Thank you. In this section, we discuss our origins, beliefs, and life ways of two tribal groups, the Cochiti Pueblo and Ogallala Lakota. Our speakers, Regis Pecos, Pecos and Ethelene Ironcloud Two Dogs began their presentations with an introduction and prayer in their native language. Opa, seom, kuhu, eh, nyan, itse, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to be blessed to have this discussion. And as we call on our ancestors, our grandpas and grandmothers, to open our minds and hearts, we're deeply blessed to have this opportunity to share and learn together. In every culture, in every society around the world, there is a beginning. And many cultures and societies refer to this universally as a time of origin, a time of creation. In the Pueblo worldview that I know best that I'm going to share with you, we are taught by our elders that that time we call the emergence. And the emergence is a reference to a time when we came from the spiritual realm into this physical realm. And at that time, the Creator gifted to us the gifts of the Creator, all that we would need in our life journey to maintain a healthy mind, body, spirit, and soul. And that was a defined and prescribed way of life. And these gifts of the Creator begin with the gift of our Mother Earth upon which to set foot in that emergence from the spiritual world into this physical world. And the Creator gifted us language as the most precious way that we would meaningfully engage in this third gift of a way of life that our elders remind us is not religion defined by others, that you engage consciously for one hour out of the day or one day out of the week, but it is a conscious engagement for your total being during the course of what our elders teach us is a gift by the Creator only one day at a time to travel along this life journey. And the Creator also gifted us our own indigenous laws and governance systems and institutions, not just to guide relationships among human beings, but among all living things that we are but a small part in this larger ecosystem, the environment that we are a part of. And the Creator also gifted to us our own governance system for the maintenance of the balance of relationships, again, not just among human beings, but among all living things, which we refer to as our relatives. And the gift of family is a gift that we are taught is the entity that receives the most precious gift that humanity will continue, and that is the sacred gift of a child. And because none of us know what gift the child brings into this world, we don't know whether that is a gift of the intellect, uh, whether it's a gift and ability to see and envision. And we are all knowledgeable in our lived experiences, people, usually elders that we are marveled and in awe of to ask ourselves, how can they see so far into the future beyond the horizon? But it is a beautiful gift of the ability that the Creator gifted, or the ability to hear, or the ability to speak and articulate and communicate and message in the teachings of our people and the gift of the ability to create, the ability to heal. And because none of us know what gift this sacred being, this spirit gifted to us through the parents and the family, our elders teach us that we must all obligate ourselves to be responsible collectively as a family and a community to nurture this sacred being and spirit so that when we fulfill that obligation and responsibility at some point 
we will be the beneficiaries of the fulfillment of some of the gifts or all of the gifts uh, of children that are brought into this world. And it sustains every aspect as, as we go through our life journey collectively. And so the family is an important part of this gift of the creator embracing that gift. And of course, as members of a community, we all become responsible through the course of our lives to recognize that every member of the community contributes in the fulfillment of these gifts to the well-being and the health of our communities. And of course, the Creator gifted us all with which to sustain us physically, mentally, and spiritually with the resources that provide for the sustenance of our well-being. And the most symbolic gift, of course, is water. And water as the giver of all life becomes symbolic of these gifts that allow us to sustain ourselves physically and spiritually. An important part is this next connecting circle that we call the core values circle. And if we ask anyone, as we do in our Leadership Institute, we could say, what is a core value that defines who you are, that defines what you do, that defines why you do what you do? And then we would have you share those core values. And then we would ask you, who gifted you this core value? And then as you acknowledge, perhaps for the first time, acknowledging who gifted you these precious core values, it is likely to be mom or dad or grandpa or grandma. And it becomes a very emotional part of sharing those core values and acknowledging who gifted you that. Because it's a recognition that it is the most precious and deepest action of those who deeply love you, to gift you something that well after they're gone back into the spirit world, that they would leave behind the very values to guide your life. And in time when you have your children, to gift to your children what will guide them through their life journey. And if you're blessed to gift those to your grandchildren. And so how we behave in the course of our daily lives. Core values they teach us, if we use to guide our personal decisions, cannot be separated in our cases today from our professional careers, that the decisions we make must always be consistent. And if we abide by those teachings, if we make decisions guided by our core values, our elders teach us we will always make the right decision. And they also teach us that where we get into trouble is when we know that we are deviating from a defined core value, not just for us personally, or our family, or our community. When we deviate from those defined core values and try to rationalize knowing that it is a deviation to try to justify that that deviation is somehow a benefit. And we compromise ourselves. And that's when our elders say we get into trouble because it creates an imbalance in our own lives, with our family, with our community. And now in deviating from these defined core values in our indigenous worldview, climate change becomes the best example of what kind of imbalance and devastation can result on the highest level. As we talk about core values, these are expressions that are reflected in defining core values as love is, as respect is, compassion, faith, understanding, forgiveness, spirituality, balance, peace, empathy, but these are all descriptions of the things most positive in our lives that we desire in our relationships, that we desire 
in nurturing our children, that we desire of our family, that we desire of the communities where we live, that defines our relationships. And the third core value or the third circle that is a connection is the circle that we call our sacred calendar of ceremony. And in Pueblo worldview, these are divided in four parts that we can say are seasonal. And whether we begin in winter and we move to spring and we move to summer and we move to the fall, it is the kind of deeply embedded daily reaffirmation of validation that faith is a very significant part as we travel from one season to another and the creator gifted us in every season ceremony as a way to continue to engage driven by our core values tied to the things that are important as we celebrate the cycles of life and so all of these are connected and the core values connected to the gifts of the creator are deeply embedded and so sometimes when our mother earth is threatened we respond with deep emotion when language loss is becoming a reality and language is so fragile it creates some really deep emotions that are reflected in the pain in the hurt and sometimes in the anger of young people asking, why didn't you teach me the most precious gift that allows for the most meaningful way in the deepest way to engage in our defined way of life. And so all of these core values are the kind of spiritual connections to the gift of the creator. And all of them are reinforced in this cycle of our sacred ceremonial calendar. And spring, as an example, is a whole series of rituals that acknowledge those that are above the ground when birds come to signal that it is time to engage in preparing the lands for planting the sacred gifts of sustenance. It is time to clear the pathways for the sacred spirit of water to nurture what we plant it is time to pay homage to to celebrate everything that lives beneath the soil in the underground that do their part in nourishing the soil that when we plant the seeds is a full complement that in time as elders teach us is like nurturing children that are plants if we take care of them if we nurture and we respect them and we water them and we we pull the weeds that can choke the life of that plant that when we do these things to fulfill the celebration and the sacredness of the seeds of life then we can celebrate in the harvest as we use the summer and we celebrate the harvest in the fall but there are so many aspects that are part of this engagement in every season that is a celebration of birth and nurturing and harvest and then a time when we retire life to hibernate until the life cycle starts again. And so it's very much like the life cycle of our life existence. And if any of you have been blessed as I've been blessed, our elders teach us that at some point in our lives, if we live long enough, that we will become children again. And I was blessed to have both my parents live that full cycle. And when they could no longer feed themselves, I was blessed to feed them. And when they were no longer able to bathe themselves i was blessed to bathe them and when they were no longer able to clothe themselves i was blessed to clothe them and it is the greatest blessing to live through a full cycle to be reminded that in my birth and innocent into this emergence pathway that i too was once a helpless spirit 
but my parents nurtured me and loved me and gave me the core values that to this day guides me. And when we share core values and who gifted us, how we live is how we honor them. And how we honor them is how their spirit continues. And if you can imagine since that time immemorial, that time of emergence, that generation after generation after generation after generation after generation, that those core values have been passed on. And so as we are part of the present, we now think about, and we are actively engaged consciously to now gift it to our children, to gift it to our grandchildren. And some are blessed to now gift it to their great grandchildren. And so this is an important part of the beginning or the creation or the origins. But in Pueblo worldview, it was the emergence from the spiritual world into this physical world. And this is the deepest part of our connection. So when children are born, the umbilical cord, when it's cut, is buried at the footsteps of a home or in the fields. And our elders teach us when we do that, the child will never forget where he or she belongs and that they might wander through all parts of the world, but they always will come back because that is the tie to the parents, to the family, to the community, and to the place that they first step foot in a kind of reactment of the movement from the spiritual world into this physical world. And so that was our beginning, that was our creation, that was our emergence into this physical world that continues to this day. In our way and in our belief, there's no such thing as an expert. There's no such thing as a somebody that knows, you know, everything about everything, <laughs> that we're all learners and that we all are, you know, on this earthly journey together, you know, as uh, learners and some people are, you know, teachers. And the person that you just heard is a teacher, you know, that has been teaching these Lakota lifeways for many, many years. So I felt like it would be only right that he have a part in this also. So I would like to say that this slide that you're seeing, Oina Jitopa, Four Stages of Life, is something that is general to the Lakota Oglala people. So Oinaji means like say a stage or a stop. Dopa is four in the Lakota language. So Oinaji Dopa refers to whenever we come from the spirit world, then we believe that we're we've been blessed, you know, to be sent here and we've been sent here with a purpose and we're have a certain path, you know, that we're supposed to follow. So I would like to acknowledge that, you know, my being sent here from the spirit world, I have a certain role, you know, and I have a certain purpose. And maybe this is one of them, you know, to be able to share what I've learned along the way. And I'm still learning, like I said. So the spirit world is something that we really uh, look forward to returning to. We came from the spirit world, we will return to the spirit world. When we're in our mother's womb, then there are certain ceremonies that are done pre-birth. There are certain beliefs and protocols that contribute to the healthy development of the um, baby in the womb, the infant spirit in the womb, and also the mother and also the father. 
And we, um, I won't go into those specific ceremonies, but I just want to make sure that we have a, an overview of this belief system and the impact that historical trauma has had on our way of life as Lakota people, as it has had an impact on indigenous peoples everywhere in the world. So whenever we come from the spirit world, when we come on earth, then the first person that welcomes us is the grandmother. The grandmother is um, considered to have a strength and characteristics that can be transmitted to the infant. And she's the first person to touch the baby. She's the first person to clean the baby's mouth. There's a ceremony that's called E O V C H A Y U J U N T A P I, and it's a spiritual cleansing of the mouth by the grandmother. But it's not only the cleansing; it's also um, her transmitting her characteristics to the infant. And sometimes, you know, it's not a might not be a um, direct grandmother, like paternal grandmother or maternal grandmother. It may be somebody that the family has chosen to do that for for the infant because for maybe for various reasons the uh, birth grandmothers are not you know available or they might not be in this world so that's really important for the first person to welcome the infant into this world be a grandmother the grandmother makes a prayer she says wopila uh, tranka which is in our language um, immeasurable gratitude that's the best way i can translate that into english and she says that to the creator you know thank you for this uh, blessing that you have given us and thank you for the the life of this baby and for the life of the mother and the father and then she will blow into the baby's mouth to give the baby the first breath of life She'll clean the baby's mouth out. Like I said, these two ceremonies uh, constitute her transmitting her characteristics to this child, this baby. Then she predicts a path for this baby. She says, Takoja, which in our Lakota language translates to grandchild. Takoja, you will be strong. You will be healthy. You will be a leader. You will be kind. You will be compassionate. So in this slide, you see some arrows within those four quadrants. What that signifies is that those um, arrows are the direction that she is showing the infant. Even though the infant is, um, you know, laying there with his or her eyes closed, you know, people think they don't comprehend, but they do. And she's talking to the baby's spirit. So the baby's spirit understands and knows and hears what she's saying. So she's showing basically the baby, the infant, a map. This is where you're going, Takoja. Uh, grandchild and so those of us you know that have been to a huge metropolitan area like new york city los angeles you know we when we get there then we're lost you know we have uh we need directions and we need a map we need um we need help getting to where we're going it's the same way with the infant the infant needs to know where to go and how to get there so she starts that process so that first stage of life is characterized by being loved by being cherished by being appreciated by being celebrated by um, having everything positive and this infant also receives a lakota name a spirit name because we believe lakota people believe that we need to have ceremonies and practices in place that will ground the infant to this earth if you look at the graphic then it shows how close the baby is to the spirit world baby can turn around and go back there's been many many instances of what's called today sudden infant death syndrome where for no apparent reason the baby seems to be in good health will turn around and go back to the spirit world so uh, we have these uh, measures in place. One of the things that takes place also after the infant is um, born is a welcoming by the extended family. So the mother's family, the father's family, everybody comes together. There's um, a meal, a buffalo robe is laid down, the 
baby is placed on the buffalo robe because in our way, the Lakota way, we take our teachings from the buffalo. So the buffalo robe signifies, represents those teachings. One of the teachings is to protect the young at all costs. People might have seen in a buffalo herd that they, when there's a threat, then they circle around the young and they protect them. And they also teach us to face challenges at all costs. And so if you watch a buffalo herd, then they will, like if there's a storm coming or a blizzard or a thunderstorm or maybe um, wolves, some kind of threat, you know, to their well-being, they'll turn around and they'll face it. They won't run away from it. And that's something that um, we are to teach our children and for us also to live by. So that buffalo robe is very significant. So each elder will come and stand on the buffalo robe and give a blessing to the baby and uh, give thanks for the baby. And in essence, what they are doing is they are saying to the creator, we take responsibility for this gift and we will make sure and ensure that this baby has every opportunity to be healthy, to be happy, to be productive. So that ceremony was binding. It, it's, um, you know, today, like there's um, baby showers and people will bring gifts and which is really wonderful. I think that's kind of uh, evolved from our teaching about, you know, welcoming the baby as a as a family as an extended family in our language it's called tioshpai so that's done to make sure that everyone knows you know that this baby has become a part of the circle and has um and that we are all responsible for the uh, well-being of this child so that first stage of life is very very important as the child reaches the age of puberty, reaches the age of transitioning from being a girl to a young woman and a boy to a young man, then there's another ceremony that's held, a very significant one, and there are the rites of passage for both girls and boys. When the boy's voice changes from a high tone to a deeper tone, then the male relatives know that they have to uh, come together to give the baby, uh, to give the uh, the boy teachings uh, to help him transition into being a young man and furthermore being a strong man. The ceremony involves four nights of going into the purification lodge and giving the males, giving them teachings about our seven sacred laws, our seven sacred ceremonies, about relationships, about everything that they need to know about becoming a strong young man. And then on the fifth day, then they take him out on a hunt, whether it's a deer hunt or a buffalo hunt, then they will teach this young man as part of the four nights of teachings that they make a relationship with that deer or with that buffalo. And they make sure that they understand that this is not a hunt for pleasure and it's not a hunt for sport, that taking the life of a deer or a buffalo, an animal, is very serious and that they have to acknowledge the families of these, uh, the deer and the buffalo, and that they should ask for forgiveness from the grandmothers of the of the herd or you know of uh, their their society their family so that's done the whenever the boy completes the hunt then he shares that with somebody that needs it maybe there's a funeral going on and maybe there's a family of maybe there's elders that can no longer hunt or don't have anybody to provide for them or maybe there's a ceremony so like say we did two manhood ceremonies this summer because our family has two sun dances. We went through that with, uh, we helped support these two young men, these two boys become young men. And, and they have the mark of providing for the people, which is a mark of being a man. So that was completed for them. 
Now the girls, whenever they reach their first monthly purification, then the female relatives will come together and say it's time for her to receive teachings to transition from a girl to a young woman. So that ceremony is called the Ishnati Awichalawampi, which in our language means they sing for her that dwells alone. Now what that refers to is our belief is that that monthly purification time is actually a ceremony. So the ceremony has to be done by itself. So that's why there will be isolation during that time. Now, the male uh, rite of passage is called a wichasha ihunipi, which is becoming a man ceremony. So we try to use the language as much as possible, you know, in referring to these ceremonies because without the language then the i guess the integrity of the ceremony is diminished so we don't call like for example the inipi we don't call that a sweat because a sweat just implies to us implies um just perspiration you know and the inipi the ceremony that term uh refers to they live or they are renewed so we try to really promote that as much as possible the language so i just wanted to take that little that make a side note there because of how important the language is so whenever she um, has her first monthly purification the female relatives will come together will take her um, set her up in a teepee and somebody will stay with her, her mother, her auntie, older sister, they'll stay with her until she completes her monthly purification cycle. During that time, she's working on something like beadwork, maybe moccasins or maybe a um, like a medicine pouch or a knife sheath. And it's really important that she completes that, you know, that beading project during that four days or five days, however long she's in there, because because she's in a spiritual time, the her purification time came when the sun passed through a certain constellation. So that time is her spiritual, powerful spiritual time. So anything that she does during that time will be, how would you say it? embedded in her or will be reinforced in her so if she completes that project then what that means for her future is that she will always complete whatever she you know sets out to do if she doesn't complete it then that would be an indication that uh, whenever she starts something she may not finish it so where the older female relatives are in there to really promote her completing that helping her talking to her and giving her teachings you know during that time whenever she's done then the inipi the purification ceremony fire is lit and she's taken into the purification lodge she's prayed with she's uh, songs are sung when she comes out she's wiped with sage and then she's taken back into the teepee and she's dressed in everything new so while during this time she was in the teepee then the relatives were preparing things for her new dress new shawl new um, everything belt hair ties you know everything and they dressed her in that way and they painted her they had the ceremony inside the teepee just the women and the men would be outside helping in whatever they way, way they could and they would be singing the songs singing at the drum for her and whenever the ceremony was complete, then they'll bring her out and they'll present her to the people as no longer a little girl. She's a young woman now. So <clears throat> what that tells the community, the people, is that to treat her as such and that uh, she's also given teachings on how to conduct herself, you know, as a young woman. She can no longer act as a little girl and that's really hard you know there's a part of the ceremony in there where the mother um, feeds her as a little girl for the last time because whenever she was a little girl when she was a baby then the mother would feed her would um, breastfeed her would uh, cook for her would feed her with her you know with her hands and um as she grew up then she would make meals for her but now as she's transitioning from being a girl to a young woman then she would um the young 
she's no longer that little girl to be fed as a little girl. So this part of the ceremony is the mother talking to her as a little girl for the last time and then feeding her as a little girl for the last time. And it's very emotional for both of them because um, they're leaving a part of the life behind that you know, was uh, very powerful for them. And now they're transitioning into a part of the stages of life where, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, you know, and so that is that ceremony is really important for them to know, you know, where they're going. So previously, I talked about how the grandmother when the infant was born, then she would talk to them and tell them, you know, predict a path for them. So this is another part of the transition and part of the map that she is to follow. So what they're showing her is, okay, you reach this point, now you're going to go here, you know, and so that's what those arrows signify on how they are, how she's going to, um, you know, progress through through life until she goes back to the spirit world. When she gets to that third stage of life and she establishes her own family, then she starts the process of passing on the teachings to her daughters. And then when she gets to that fourth stage of life, then she becomes that person to be depended on for guidance, for teachings, ensuring social order, you know, observing custom law and ensuring, you know, spiritual order. And hopefully one day, you know, when it's her time, there'll be no sickness, no accidents, no trauma. She'll go to sleep, maybe a hundred years old and peacefully go back to the spirit world. That's the hope and the prayer that we have as Lakota people is that we can be restored to this and return to this, that all of our children will have that opportunity to become healthy elders. If you look at the bottom of the slide, there's uh, in the yellow bar, yellow highlighted area, wotakuye, which is a Lakota word for kinship, is the foundation of Lakota society. And that kinship is what holds us together. So every male, you know, relative of a young boy that was transitioning knew that they had to take part and contribute to the manhood ceremony. Every female relative, when the young girl um, became a young woman, whenever she got her first monthly purification, they knew to uh, contribute to be a part of her transition, that they were responsible for that. And that's really important to acknowledge because that's how we survived, you know, for thousands of years is as relatives and as helping one another. Following is a narrative on the history of a colonization and the effects on American Indian people by our colleague BC Echohawk. We will also hear from Mr. Pecos Pueblo perspective on impositions, followed by doctors Josie Chase and Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, speaking to the American Indian survival perspective. American Indian history is generally divided into several eras of time. Each of these eras are defined by events or governmental policies that created trauma, separation, and impositions on our indigenous ways of being that have had lasting impact. Early colonization created a challenge to our worldview, ways of being, how we related to each other, and the land where we live. The removal era began westward expansion, massive land loss, and mass genocide. The assimilation era, marked by the boarding school era that persists today, removed approximately 85% of all American Indian children from their families, tribes, traditions, culture, and language. The effort to eradicate indigenous identity impacted family and tribal systems for generations. The reorganization era created governmental systems that ran counter to pre-existing traditional forms of governance. The termination era renewed efforts at ending tribal identities and pushed forward mass land loss and land grabs. The current era of self-determination came into being with the passage of the Indian Education and Self-Determination Act of 1975, while our nations faced continued threats to our livelihood, traditions, culture, religion, and sovereignty. It also marks movement into cultural revitalization and healing from historical trauma. 
What set in motion these events began a world away with the passage of papal bulls issued by the Catholic Church. Combined, these documents became the foundational elements of the doctrine of discovery that justified European explorers' claims to land, labor, and jurisdiction. This doctrine of discovery is an element of settler colonialism, where trauma is rooted in systems of power that perpetuated genocide and repression of indigenous cultures. It persists to the present with exploitation of resources and the dispossession of lands where our people originated. Manifest Destiny, as exemplified in the painting American Progress, encapsulates that vision of settler colonialism. As settlers acted on governmental rule and expansion, policies were created to support this extended colonial rule. The heart of our Leadership Institute is to create an understanding for young people especially, but it has grown to also engage adults of our community with regard to what I shared was the emergence of our people into this world. And for the times that our elders share and teach us was a beautiful time, a beautiful time in fulfilling the tenets and the covenants of a way of life gifted to us by our creator. When language flourished and a way of life was vibrant and the laws and customs created relationships among all living things that created a sense of balance and harmony and coexistence. Families were vibrant in their spirit. Communities thrived and natural resources provided us the sustenance for the maintenance of a healthy mind, body, and spirit. And water in its most purest form sustained our life and gave to all living things a means to continue to be collectively as part of an ecosystem gifted to us by our creator. And in turn, we connect it with our core values to flourish and to be vibrant and thrive to build classic civilizations as now history reflects and gives credit to this incredible civilizations and societies that lived well before the beginning of contact in this world that is now the United States of America and how our traditional and sacred calendar engaged us to, to fulfill our sense of spirituality and well-being in the maintenance of a healthy mind, body, and spirit that contributed to the vibrancy of families and entire communities engaging in this kind of world gifted to us. But elders predicted and prophesied as the creator cautioned and the creator warned that at some point along our journey that there would be others who would come upon us upon the lands gifted to us and that it would be the ultimate test with regard to how well we would respond to the temptations and to the threats to the very gifts of our creator and it manifested in that kind of prophecy forewarned by our elders that in this region of the country of Pueblo nations, the Apache and the Dene, but I'll focus on the history of the Pueblo, became part of the first contact with conquistadors from Spain and then later from Mexico and then much later by the United States. But this was the forewarning and true to that forewarning taught by our elders that they represented a very threat to every gift of our creator, to the language, to a way of life, to our laws and customs, to our governance systems and institutions, to family, community and our resources. And over time, that wave of colonization, of infringement and imposition, as we experienced with Spain, and we experienced with Mexico, and as we experienced with the United States, it has been a nonstop, continued process 
of being subjected to impositions, disruptions that has resulted in the threat to our very existence. And this particular slide is something that we use in our leadership institute to have young people and members of our community to become familiar with a history of these impositions of policies and laws that were purposefully conceived with every intent to destroy and to connect us from our lands, as was the case with Spanish, the conquistadors, with Mexico, but the focus on the United States and the ways in which policies were conceived and implemented that was built upon the mantra beginning with boarding schools, that the way you kill language and the way you kill culture is to remove children from that culture and deny those children their language and culture. So there was a very purposeful conceived policy and later laws that were enacted that prohibited us from speaking our own languages, first in boarding schools and in my personal experience in the day schools. And it continues re-imaged in other ways now in public schools. It was a purposeful, intentionally created law to make it a crime for us to continue our engagement in a way of life to make that engagement a crime that was now prohibited. A country established, founded upon the free exercise of religion, now in its own constitution, denied the first peoples who were here long before others came to create the United States of America and its constitution, it would deny us the free exercise of our way of life. It also attempted to completely reorganize through the Indian Reorganization Act, our indigenous governance systems, imposing American forms of democracy. Voting became a way imposed upon us to elect leaders and in that process created a fragmentation where there were winners and losers in what was supposed to be a democratic process. Just like the United States continued to do so in the name of democracy all around the world, we were among the first subjects to be imposed upon in reorganizing our indigenous governance systems. I'm blessed to have been appointed multiple times to serve as a leader of my Pueblo using the traditional indigenous governance systems and institutions that continue to survive. The whole dismantling of family was a clearly intentional imposition in the policies and laws that were created. I don't know how many people know that there was something called the American Adoption Project that the BIA created and funded to have our children after the boarding school era devastated families and communities to now engage in the adoption out of our children to non-Indian families known as the American Indian Adoption Project. It is unheard of and unbelievable that that would be a continuation of what was supposed to be a more humane way in the creation of boarding schools using education as a way to assimilate us. And of course, that continues in various forms. Housing becomes such a means of undoing the social organization of Pueblo communities by creating subdivisions and separating communities from its core through that kind of economic and cost-effective means, but completely re-imaging and destroying not just the aesthetics, but having a great impact on the social organization to this very day. And it continues with the imposition as was in the early stages looking for silver and gold that let the conquistadors into Pueblo country. So is the case today that uranium and coal and oil and gas continue to be the sources of colonizers as it was in the beginning continues to this day. So this 
slide is a reflection of all of the purposeful ways in which the most powerful government in the world has been very intentional, beginning with the earliest days in the systems and institutions they created. Even the highest courts of the United States, the United States Supreme Court is built on this white supremacy, making early decisions that defined us to not have right over our lands, indigenous to us, that colonizers came to take forcefully through their actions of cultural genocide, of wars that engaged to exterminate us because we were in the way of manifest destiny. So this is simply a way to understand how over generations these impositions of policies and laws began and continue to this day, unchanged by a continuum of this kind of impositions that continue to destroy our systems and institutions. But we are tremendously blessed that was foretold that under the worst conditions of what we could be subjected to, that if we held strong to sustain and protect and preserve the tenets and the covenants, the gifts of the creator, that that would be the ultimate test of our love for the gifts of the creator. And many people in every generation since that time of first contact have sacrificed tremendously to define our inheritance today. And where we stand today, similarly, or what the elders teach us, must be a preservation of the sacred trust that we too of this time and generation will do all that is necessary to define what future generations inherit from us. Our approach to healing historical trauma and unresolved grief, we look at our primary institutions that serve American Indian people, and that's the BIA and Indian Health Service. Those institutions were founded under the Department of War. Originally, the BIA education system was called the Civilization Division. So that was their view of us, that we were uncivilized, that they needed to transform us into more cooperative human beings that were like-minded with their frame of reference. And um, we cite this policy that's written in the congressional records. And it says the intention was to no further recognize their rights to the land over which they roam, to go upon said reservations, to choose between this policy of the government and extermination, uh, wards of the government controlled and managed at its discretion. You know, there was this forced assimilation and the intention was to civilize us and subjugate us. Our access to our lands, our resources, um, removing our culture and spirituality, which we'll talk more in depth about. So I also want to point out that our process or development of this whole historical trauma theory and healing intervention has been one steeped in our Lakota and indigenous culture, spirituality, and that we always took an approach of prayer and honoring our ancestors. We called on them for help and guidance as we took on this work way back in the late 80s or earlier, and we'll talk more about our history, working together on the topic of healing historical trauma and unresolved grief. But this picture that we dedicated a lot of our work to is our grandfather, uh, Sitting Bull, his mother, her holy door, daughter, and grandchild to the right. So that's just an example of our families at the time. And although he was a great warrior, he was a family man and he was a healer as well. This next quote is from a video that was produced in the 90s called Wiping the Tears of the Seven Generations, 
the Bigfoot Memorial ride. Maria, did you want to take this slide and talk about it? Yes. So this ride was four years of preparation. And then the fifth year was in 1990, which was 100 years after the Wounded Knee Massacre. But also it started out at Sitting Bull Camp and a lot of the band was chased and killed and incarcerated. So it was the two weeks of fleeing from the cavalry. So the language that you see on the slide is important to look at because it's not just cultural disruption or people minimize that and it meets the Geneva Convention definition on genocide, our history does. So one of the, the quotes was um, by General Sherman was first clear off the buffalo, then clear off the Indian. We must act with vindictive earnest against the Sioux, even to their total extermination, men, women, and children. So that's in the records, that's in black and white. And then Patrick Cudmore, who used to be at uh, Oglala Lakota College, had this quote, and he said, never before in the whole of human history was the near extermination of a race been so total and complete as it was in the United States. And then a white historian that was at the Newberry Library in Chicago, and she shared a document with me that she was commissioned uh, to prepare for the Black Hills land claim case. And so she said, which is really powerful, the U.S. never intended for the long-term survival of the Lakota, but treaty, treaties became a cheaper alternative to war. So there wasn't any kind of benevolence or values about our survival. People sort of try to say, minimize it and say, oh, it was cultural disruption or cultural genocide. People to know, both native and non-native people to wrestle with that reality. The boarding school in this section, we review the history of boarding schools in Indian country. While this is not new to many of us, we would be remiss to forego an overview of such an impactful time in our history. Ethlene Ironcloud Two Dogs will discuss attempts to disrupt ceremonial practices by state and federal authorities, specifically in the Lakota community. We end this section with a brief overview of additional policies introduced to American Indian Alaska Native communities. School era struck a new tactic in dealing with the Indian issue. Brigadier General Richard Henry Pratt, a longtime military man, was chosen to lead and supervise Indian prisoners housed at Fort Marion, Florida. During that time, he began experimenting with education with those in prison. This gave way to the concept for the boarding school system as a means of transforming our population through assimilation. The impact was profound, stripping children and young adults of language and culture. Many did not survive. One of the things that should be acknowledged is that in every stage of life, then there were ceremonies that happened. One of them, like I mentioned, was the welcoming ceremony. Within that first stage of life, there was also the ear marking ceremony where um, they would mark their ears with red earth paint using an eagle claw, uh, the, the infant, and they would pierce their ears. And um, every male and female had their ears pierced as an infant. And what that whole represented was uh, entrance for the spiritual teachings to enter and to uh, be retained by the in the by the spirit of the infant. So and then as they grew older, then they had, like I mentioned, the Ishnatiawichalompi, the female rite of passage, the Wichasha Ihunipi, the becoming a man ceremony. Um, then as they got older, then they would become, they would uh, go on a vision quest, the Hamblecha, they would go, they might Sundance, the Wiwang Wachipi. But one of the things that happened was that all of these ceremonies were outlawed you know, at one time, and we had to go underground with our with our ceremonies in order to retain the teachings and the protocols that went with each ceremony. Then there were people that had to hide, you know, literally hide their, I guess, their ceremonial items, their 
uh, teachings. There was, um, you know, a lot of uh, people that had um, ancestral teachings that were targeted, and you know, it was they were called Indian offenses. You know, that these sun dances, like having um, multiple uh, partners, um, the ceremonies conducted by medicine men, you know, even the cohabitation, it was seen as, you know, two people, if they weren't married in a court of law or by a priest, then that was illegal. Uh, and we didn't have that. We didn't have any courts or we didn't have priests that married people. You know, they made a, a commitment to um, two people whenever they want to be together, then they would make a commitment and they would have a, a marriage bundle. And in that marriage bundle were items that signified their, which symbolized their um, commitment to each other. And they, they took care of that marriage bundle as uh, very sacred. You know, they carried it just like, you know, like they would an infant. So that was their symbol of commitment but western society seen that as you know cohabitation um intoxication trafficking in liquor you know there was a lot of i guess fear around you know what we could do as a people uh, regarding you know ceremonies and so when there's fear then people react you know like well we don't know we don't understand that you know what, whatever they're doing we need to outlaw it so that's what happened and the medicine people particularly were targeted you know a lot of the medicine people they would the police would come and they would um try to take their their altars or their um their their um spiritual bundles as they call them you know, whatever they use to perform the ceremonies, they would take them and they would destroy them. So what our people did was that they started to hide them. And a lot of times they would hide them like in caves or in tree, you know, tree trunks. Um, and some of them even made decoys, you know, where they would make something that looked like, like a spiritual bundle, but it wasn't. And then whenever they would and ask for you know, to take it to destroy it then they would give them that you know so our people were very um were very clever <laughs> i guess we're very adaptable and they knew how to survive so you know the the laws that were created to outlaw our spiritual ceremonies really didn't work you know it, uh, today you know we have um this is 2021 and we have sundance ceremonies we have people going you know on vision quests we have naming ceremonies we have the rites of passage ceremonies you know we have all of them that have survived now some of them we've lost things along the way so like for example there's songs that go with certain ceremonies that we haven't um, really retained and that we hope and pray that someday that those songs will come back, you know, so, but we are um, still trying to, you know, continue on with keeping our traditions and our ceremonies, you know, alive and giving them life. So these, the Indian Offenses Act was designed, you know, to um, outlaw all of our ceremonies and disconnect us from from our ceremonies and also to be, um, I think they were, it was designed to, to shame us, you know, into like saying your ceremonies are nothing, you're nothing. So we would think badly of ourselves and we would be ashamed of our identity and we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't practice our, uh, engage in our ceremonies, you know, and maybe for some it did work um, because there are people that will say, you know, that those are, those are ancient and i've heard even our own people say you know that's devil worship and there'll be people that will say you know um we have to move on we have to progress when we know that our ceremonies are what keeps us intact keeps us strong and keeps us you know who we are you know as a people as the federal policy timeline progressed new tactics emerged to address the indian issue the reorganization era sought to replace traditional systems of governance, many rooted in religious and ceremonial practice, with forms of government that mirrored the United States model. 
It also codified the use of blood quantum as a measure of defining American Indian status and later became a tool in determining eligibility for tribal enrollment, a tool now used to separate or designate individuals as not Indian enough. The termination era also resurrected the assimilationist movement in attempting to place hundreds of young American Indian men, women, and families in large urban centers and cities to create productive citizens. Over time, this resulted in mass movement and the birth of the urban Indian population. Many people in, in all of our lived experiences, all of us, all have examples in our own personal lives, in our own lived experiences, people telling us when we share what we are sharing about the history, that it's not about Indian history. It is about a shared history, but it is the ultimate tragedy of what American education has purposefully robbed all of us from knowing. And so our elders teach us that where we deviate from our core values, there can be tremendous cost and consequences. And we know that by personal experience when we too, as human beings have wondered and what the costs are at a personal level, at a family level, and at a community level. And sometimes as we are engaging to share this truth gifted to us from our elders in our oral societies by word of mouth of their experiences in their time, what they were subjected to, what they learned, how they responded that is passed on to us. This slide is simply a reflection of the many ways in which the earliest forms of what the United Nations and the Declaration of Indigenous Rights refer to as examples of the worst crimes against humanity, speaking of those intentionally, purposefully conceived policies and laws that attack every gift of our Creator that every threat was responded to with great sacrifice. But as we talk about that history, not about just Indian history, but our shared history inclusive of everyone who is now part of the United States of America, it's not an isolated history of us as indigenous people. Those who inflicted, those who imposed, those who subjected generations of our people are part of that history. They need to insert themselves to take ownership that it's not what we talk about today, Indian history. It's their history as well. And it's time that they too take responsibility to own that history as tragic as their ancestors gifted to them as we are proud to survive based on those sacrifices to celebrate our inheritance. It continues today from those times in the 30s with reorganization. It continues as our people of our communities in World War I, in World War II, in the Korean conflict, to all the conflicts, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Afghanistan to this day, those are also in positions upon our people that resulted in many of our people, even as we are reflecting in the darkest chapters of American history, what this country did to our people, our people were willing to put those aside and join the military to protect this country. I had an opportunity to interview Governor Tony Reyna, who is one of the natives and the last survivors of the Bataan death march when he was about in his 90s. He was a classmate of my father at the Santa Fe Indian School. And I asked him, I said, Governor Reyna, why did you join the military 
to fight in a war when you didn't even have and our people didn't even have the right to vote. And he took off his glasses and we were sitting where you could see the sacred Taos Blue Lake. And he pointed and he said, son, I was fighting for my people and our lands. And it was an insight that I am certain that despite all of the worst ways in which our people were subjected to dying along that journey, that somewhere within them, they still gave their lives, many of them, to fight for their people, to fight for their homelands gifted to them. So there's a dichotomy in all of that. And yet when they came back, they didn't have the right to vote. And I asked him, how did you survive the war as a prisoner of war? And he pointed to the picture of his mom and his grandma. And he said, I survived 